And now we're going to have a session that's going to look at spaces beyond the state. To lead this discussion, AGS counselor Tony Quartararo has assembled a panel of international world experts who are going to look at places that are often not clearly defined by borders and are beyond the control of the traditional state. Tony, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, John. Welcome, uh, everybody. Thank you for sticking around this afternoon. Um, this is an interesting panel to me, uh, thinking about some of the things that don't traditionally correspond to uh, enumeration, meaning uh, uh, normal boundaries that we would typically see on a map, either by physical geography or uh, superimposed state boundaries, country boundaries. Uh, so we've got a few panelists up here that I'm going to introduce briefly uh, that are going to talk about those things, primarily space, uh, the polar regions, um, oceans, and then kind of transnational crime or, or terrorism uh, that's been a lot in the news the last several years. Um, so uh, these are the things that, that are the topic of, of the panel, and I, I'm looking forward to what our panelists have to, to say. So first up, immediately to my right, uh, Ms. Christina Gerd. She's at the International Union of uh, Conservation of Nature. Um, and again, uh, we've been asked not to read, obviously, the whole bio, so please check your programs for more details about each of them. Um, immediately to her right, uh, we have Lawson who's going to speak to us. Uh, he's at the University of uh, Alaska at Fairbanks. He's going to talk to us again about the Arctic uh, and some of the issues that are uh, occurring in the, in the Arctic. Uh, Peter Martinez. Peter's at the Secure World Foundation. He's going to speak to us uh, about things in space and the issues that are emerging in that regard. And then lastly, uh, uh, on the far uh, left, your left, uh, is uh, Neda Bekos. Uh, she's the author of uh, the book, The Targeter, and I would encourage you to, to, to look at that. She's got uh, uh, more than 10 years of, of work at, at CIA, um, and, and she's uh, going to be talking to us about uh, these transnational issues. So without any further comment on my end, we'll have some questions at the end, uh, but I'll turn it over to Christina. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I thought I'd start the presentation with a real upper today. Uh, that was, we have been hearing all sorts of good news stories, but also bad news stories about what is happening to our planet. Um, I am a lawyer by training, not a geographer, but I am married to a geographer, Adam Poole, so I hope that counts. Um, also an offspring of a teacher and an immigrant, uh, and feeling very comfortable here because I'm truly excited about how we can convert this projected future from a scenarios training program into a much brighter future for us all through a combination of law and your applied geospatial information tools and technologies and information processing facilities. So with that, I'm going to use the map that has inspired me for the past 10 years um, and even longer. It was a product of a 10-year census of marine life. That's where we were trying to find out the distribution, abundance, and diversity of marine species as they make their way across our watery planet. It is, of course, 70% um, ocean, and three quarters of that is areas beyond national jurisdiction. But these species that many of us care about, the sea turtles, the sharks, the seabirds, and even the tuna, do not respect those boundaries. In fact, sea, um, elephant seals will spend 70% of their time in the high seas. The technologies that were developed by Duke University, Stanford University, and many other places have enabled us to start tagging and tracking these species as they venture across from Los Angeles to Tokyo, and some even make their ways back. Thousands of kilometers are spent, not purposefully drifting as we used to assume, but actually trying to hone in on the best places to find your mates, shelter, or to feed. That's, this, in many ways, has helped to put a face on the high seas that we were then able to take to policymakers at the United Nations, at the Convention on Biological Diversity, and at the Convention on um, Migratory Species, to actually say, we can use these tools and technologies to better protect our ocean life, despite the increasing footprint of humankind. 
Um, one thing that is both depressing but also gives me hope is that we've been able to repurpose tools like automatic um, ship identification systems. They're originally developed to avoid collisions at sea um, in narrow passageways. But instead, clever technology experts like Christina Berda up at Dalhousie has figured out a way to actually make these tracks shine and to be able to see them from space. So we start to get a foot, um, imagine an image of the distribution of human activities going on in areas that used to be out of sight and out of mind. At the same time, law, of course, is just an artificial construct and develops these artificial boundaries. In 1982, when lawyers um, and diplomats were negotiating the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, I have a feeling they were more focused on solidifying the rights and duties of states with respect to territorial boundaries, that 12 nautical miles, a bit further than you can shoot a cannon, and out to 200 nautical miles, the exclusive economic zone. The challenge is that they left responsibility for the care and maintenance of areas beyond national jurisdiction in the hands of flag states, the vessels where the, sh the states where the ships are registered for merchant shipping or for fishing or other future activities. And that, according to the recent book by Ian Urbina, a reporter for the New York Times, has created a vast underbelly in humanity's um, sphere of activities that has for too long gone off the radar screen. It's a scene for sea slavery, for indentured servitude, uh, let alone the illegal fishing that I had been most concerned about. That's, it's the willingness of states to allow this lawless frontier to continue that we are seeking to confront through a new United Nations agreement to implement the provisions of the Law of the Sea Convention in areas beyond national jurisdiction. I would say Ian Urbina was just in Congress, same time as the impeachment hearings. I'm not sure it got as much publicity, but it's well worth watching his five-minute spiel about the problems that are going on in the high seas. I won't say Ian Urbina started his story wanting to tell about environmental degradation in the high seas. Instead, his editors told him, focus on the human story. Well, the human story and the environmental story are very much intertwined. Because this story that is coming out from the Stockholm Resilience Center about radical ocean futures 2050, the scenarios and pathways for going forward, is telling us that if we neglect our ocean, if we continue to use it as a trash bin, if we continue to use it as a storage bin for our carbon dioxide, we will soon be in the um, shoes of this last fisher who's just caught his last fish. And the problem, of course, is with climate change, things are going to be getting even worse than we may have expected in the 1970s and 1980s. The most recent IPCC report, special report on oceans in the cryosphere, have told policymakers, suggested politely, I should say, in diplomatic speak, uh, that it is time to get our act together, that we need to have more coherent management institutions, we need to have protected areas, we need to reduce the pressures, the level of footprint on our oceans, and we need to act soon, meaning now, meaning 20 years ago. Um, but what their main message really is, are, it was, is that the choices made now are really critical for the future of our ocean, our cryosphere, and our planet as a whole. So what I'm going to spend the few minutes I have left is trying to elaborate on some of these thoughts also established in another scenario study, this time looking to mitigation and adaptation frameworks and future ways forward, um, looking in the context of climate change and our oceans. This illustration is one of the alternative pathways to the last fissure, and this one is about actually using robotics to find those last little shreds of plastics um, now that we've been able to recover and restore our coral reefs and our fishery resources. And to do this, of course, we need to take a few steps, which is to recognize that we do have boundaries at sea, and these are environmental boundaries. Um, even if nobody respects the um, static boundaries. That's we need effective and persistent collaboration, coordination at all levels, including the global. We need strong and flexible institutions, 
And I'm just going to pause here for a moment on inclusive growth and sort of highlight a couple of opportunities we now have ahead of us. One is this international treaty we are negotiating to help conserve biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction that has a main component about capacity building and technology transfer. And a lot of this can be um, accomplished through really taking a global perspective and acting locally in order to lift all boats to go ahead. The UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development is undergoing right now. It's planned for launching in 2021 to uh, 2030. And I would say there's truly a dearth of geographers involved in this. I happen to be on the executive planning group. And so I'd really encourage some of you to help Pay attention to help bring forward why the idea of how humans and animals interact in space and through time is going to play a critical role in how we better manage our planet. That was um, just as an example of how we are applying these AIS technologies. Global Fishing, Fishing Watch, Google, and other groups are actually being able to utilize and process the data to detect where fishing vessels are. And then like here in Suriname, when they are going inside the exclusive economic zone, these tools can be used to help coastal states better enforce their own fisheries laws. But when and if we do get our marine protected areas on the high seas, they also serve to answer that persistent question of, oh, if you're going to protect the ocean, how are you ever going to manage it because it's so big and far away? We do now have our eyes in the sky. We do now have our technologies that can inform us as to who is doing what where. But if we are going to use these to help protect our species, as in this example here, in the Pacific Ocean, the United States has sort of told fishers, you have a hard bycatch quota. You can only catch so many sea turtles before we shut down the entire fishery. That makes the fishers very happy to use the sea surface temperature, which indicates the habitat preference for loggerhead sea turtles. But we don't have that yet to apply to all vessels on the high seas. We don't have hard quotas on how many vulnerable species can be caught in the high seas. This is why we need strong and resilient and flexible institutions. We need our regional fisheries management organizations to take to bite the bullet of restraint in fishing activities. We cannot fish our planet to its actual limits. We need also global accountability and scrutiny of what is going on in these, in these variety of organizations. So this new treaty that is under negotiation at the UN has its fourth and hopefully final meeting in March next year, 2020. Will it truly be able to come up with a system of governance that will last into the next 30 years? Will it truly be able to give us a system of flexible management and technological adaptation to enable flexible and dynamic measures of protection? Hard and fast marine protected areas, but also measures to protect those species, just like people on the move. So I'd just like to close with a message of hope that we can turn the tide, we can find a way to restore resilience to our tropical coral reefs in spite of rapidly growing climate change if we can instill protected areas, if we can stall measures to ensure the sustainability of our current activities and to make sure that new activities are all subject to environmental impact assessments and stopped before they do greater harm. So I just say stay tuned. Uh, that was, we have um, hope and time on our side, building political will and awareness of climate change. And what we need to go along with it is like this cosmic jelly is feelers that look up and down and all around, even as the environment around it is moving, full maritime domain spatial awareness. Thank you for your attention. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me here. I'm supposed to give some perspective on the Arctic. I have only one slide of the Antarctic, but I can make a few comments about the bottom of the world. Uh, this is the uh, international chart, uh, uh, bathymetric chart of the Arctic Ocean. 
gives you some perspective without the sea ice. The sea ice has been swept aside, and you can see the, the depths of the Arctic Ocean, shallower than most oceans, 4,000 meters at the, at the North Pole. But on the right-hand side of uh, Eurasia, you can see the largest continental shelves of the world. Of course, the seabed, is, uh, the specter is, of course, for oil and gas uh, resources at, 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 at the bottom of the top of the world. This is a map showing the sea ice, particularly year 2015, the height of summer, and that, that uh, the sea ice is a dynamic barrier, in a sense, but dynamic boundary uh, for controlling marine use. We bring in the, the traffic on this year. You can see uh, for, for the past 70 years, the sea ice has controlled this traffic in the height of summer, uh, about 4,000 passages of fishing vessels and tankers, LNG carriers, et cetera, at the top of the world. So the boundary, the, the, the barrier to shipping is, is changing, of course, as you know, and mid-century we'll have uh, ice-free Arctic, at least for a period of time, either a few days, a week, a month, or maybe two months' time, where all the ice that is left is seasonal ice, what's called first-year ice at the top of the world. So we'll see an increase in traffic across the top of the world, either on the coast in, uh, through Canada or on the Russian coast, where there has been a lot of traffic and increasing traffic already. This is a map uh, produced by uh, the U.S. Um, Ge Geological Survey, 2008. What they did was survey uh, the seabed and the land side of the Arctic, all land areas and sea areas above uh, the Arctic Circle, and integrated uh, all the information to show and give some probability of the presence of, uh, of uh, oil and gas around the Arctic Basin. What's interesting, if you look in the center of the Arctic Ocean, there's no color shading. There's no oil and gas uh, in the center of the Arctic Ocean where there may be a global commons. The rest of the place is all under the sovereign st uh, coastal state control. So all the blue shades, the darker shades, where there's a high probability of oil and gas uh, can be correlated uh, off the coast of Alaska, Greenland, and in the Russian Arctic for those, those three areas. So, so really the specter of a great race to the center of the Arctic Ocean for oil and gas is misinformed and it's likely all uh, the oil and gases under very tight uh, Arctic state control uh, around, around the basin in, in the decades to come. To separate it out from the, the politics and of course the financial uh, uh, concerns and economics of oil and gas development, most of the oil and gas development will probably be developed land side, but carried by sea to global markets out of the Arctic. These maps show from left to right the change in the, the, the uh, sovereignty of the seabed. Under UNCLOS, the United Nations uh, Convention on the Law of the Sea, one article allows the coastal state to extend out beyond the 200 nautical miles, of which we've talked about here, the EEZ, even out to 300 nautical miles. When you do that, the map in the right shows what's left. The shaded areas are, in fact, the global commons of the seabed at the top of the world. So there's not much left. And they're all in areas where there isn't any oil and gas, which is, which is intriguing. I mean, you can go drill there, 2,000 meters deep, but it's likely not to find anything. So for seabed, now for fishing, of course, this uh, on the left-hand side map, that boundary you can see that outlines the EEZ, that is the global commons for fisheries. And there's a new fisheries agreement, only a year and a half old, which, uh, uh, 11 states and the EU have signed uh, to prohibit fishing, commercial fishing, at the top of the world in this global commons uh, and, and uh, for a period of about 15 years. And, and so what will happen is, this is all based upon precautionary principle, it's a good role model for the rest of the world where this global commons is already under some uh, control uh, by some states coastal states of the Arctic Ocean and other states, fisheries nations, uh, Japan, Korea, China, EU countries, and, uh, and, uh, and others. So new maps 
that all relate to the changing nature of the changing seabed and application of unclose. Lots of satellite maps, these are static ones. I've chosen these because the right-hand map is the least extent of sea ice in the observed record. But what you see, all these false color images, so the sea ice is a, has a color to it, a uh, percentage of ice cover. These are all passive microwave images. They're very, very telling in the change since the 70s till, till now in the coverage of sea ice. But what we see is greater areas of darkness, dark black ocean, open ocean, ice-free conditions as we move, th move through the century. But I, but I think it's also important to show you the maps in the wintertime. I've integrated uh, the, the wintertime maps of 2017 and 2018 just to give you a feel and, and in working in the Arctic Council to remind the diplomats who are our customers, the place is ice covered, the place is ice covered through the century and beyond. If it is not ice covered, the planet will be in huge trouble. Uh, so the winter ice will remain, which creates an interesting barrier and boundary for marine traffic at the top of the world. You see the white around us, all the snow cover at the top of the world in the wintertime. It's all darkness, of course. The satellites are working through the darkness and, and, and picking up the back radiation of the Earth, both in the snow cover and the sea ice. So these, these uh, satellite images, of course, are uh, hugely important to, uh, in this case, the marine use and access navigation seasons at, at, at the top of the world. New, uh, in a sense, a geopolitical map. It's a search and rescue agreement, a treaty signed by the Arctic states in 2011, and it outlines areas of responsibility. So this was negotiated for about a year to delineate what areas, you can see a huge area of, of the Russian Federation, fairly large area of the United States that goes down into the North Pacific, large area for Canada, all relative size to the size of the Arctic state. So we have a new set of maps, this one in particular, ones on environmental pollution and, and uh, response, but this one gives responsibility detailed in a, uh, in a, ge a static geographic map who is responsible for responding to a major incident, search and rescue in this case, in that particular area. Two more static maps. This one, the only map I have of Antarctica, we, uh, the, the previous speaker, one of the previous speakers spoke about marine protected areas in the Ross Sea. Uh, but this is uh, the boundary of the International Maritime Organization's polar code. Polar code details structural standards of ships. It, it, it responds to the Maritime Pollution Convention, uh, prohibiting discharge of oil and oil waste in, in the polar regions, and a whole set of new regulations for marine safety, uh, education of the, who's, who's driving the ship, the education of the pilot house, and, and the mar mariners and the mates and, and their training uh, at, at uh, in this case, the bottom of the world. But at the top of the world, the map is slightly different because it takes into account uh, the North Atlantic drift, the warming of the Gulf Stream, and so this map is in the Atlantic correlated to the, the uh, essentially the maximum sea ice extent in the historical record, averaged over about 30 years, which is in fact changing itself under climate change. So we're gonna have some new um, maps that detail regulations that no doubt will be dynamic. The map will be uh, advanced into, deeper into the Arctic Ocean as, as the sea ice retreats to cover the changes in regulatory, uh, um, the regulations for these ships. My final map is, is this one, just to show you the complexity. This is a UK university, Durham University. They've, out, they've tried to portray all the overlapping claims, the exclusive economic zone, the high seas area, and the overlapping seabed claims under Article 76. It's interesting that the Russian Federation and Canada and Denmark have overlapping seabed claims at the bottom of the top of the world at 4,000 meters. So those claims overlap. The commission here, the uh, Commission on the Outer Limits of the Continental Shelf here, here in New York at the UN, uh, adjudicate some of this, but the, th the states themselves will have to uh, uh, adjudicate and, and draw up a, a treaty themselves on who actually owns, in effect, 
the top of the world. I'll just finish with some comments about the drivers of change in the Arctic. Uh, certainly, the Arctic is becoming uh, globalized in a sense of the tie of natural resources to global markets. A lot of stuff up on the top of the world, copper, nickel, tin, oil and gas, et cetera, et cetera, diamonds, and, and the, those will be provided to global markets through the century and beyond. The question will be with oil and gas, how, how the markets uh, uh, will change with uh, mitigation uh, efforts. But just as profound, I mean, as globalization, of course, is a profound climate change itself at the top of the world, changing all of the maps on glaciers, sea ice, et cetera. Uh, as you probably all know, there's twice the temperature elevation at the top of the world compared to lower latitudes like here. Indigenous people's rights and challenges is a huge issue for the, for the Arctic states, for the indigenous people themselves, for the planet, food security, um, sustainability of their cultural heritage, et cetera. But the Arctic cannot be devo uh, divorced from geopolitics. Certainly when you think about sanctions, they impact Arctic uh, development. But more important, this internal struggle and adjudication of claims at the top of the world will create a whole new set of, of maps and boundaries uh, to de detail what the outcomes of these uh, trends are. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Peter Martinez. It's a great pleasure to be here this afternoon. My first uh, time attending the um, conferences in this series, and I've certainly had a very enjoyable two days here. I begin with a confession. I'm not a geographer. I'm an astronomer by training, turned space diplomat, and but I've always had a fascination with maps, and uh, I um, have really learned a lot in the last two days. For those of you who haven't heard about Secure World Foundation, the organization that I'm uh, the executive director of, um, we are a private operating foundation based here in the U.S., but with an international footprint. And we work with governments, with the UN, with industry and academia to promote the responsible, peaceful and sustainable uses of outer space for the benefit of all nations. Now, we've heard several times during this meeting that space is the one domain that borders all states. And so it seems quite appropriate to be thinking about this in a conference titled Borders and a Borderless World. Space is a domain that we are all increasingly relying on in our daily lives. And I don't only mean governments, I mean people um, individually. When we think about space, um, very often the, uh, to the uninitiated, this is the kind of thing that comes to mind. Um, you know, the International Space Station, uh, planetary exploration, and indeed, space exploration has really taught us a lot about the universe that we live in, and in fact, a lot about planet Earth through things like comparative planetology. But the planet that matters most to us is the one that we actually live on. And so, space technologies have um, really helped us to uh, develop the sorts of capabilities that we will need to support us in the achievement of the sustainable development goals. But of course, we also rely on them personally in our daily lives. For example, some 30 to 40% of, of smartphone applications are relying in some way or another on space systems. If you have a cell phone and it's on right now, you are ultimately relying on a space system. Indeed, space is so embedded in our modern uh, in the plumbing of modern life that a day without space is really, uh, would really be a very, very bad day. Now, we're seeing a growth in the number of space actors and space applications, which is fantastic, lots of potential there, but it also raises concerns for the safety, sustainability, and security of outer space activities. And in many of the presentations at this conference, and indeed the, the GEO community in general, the continuity of space data is something that is taken for granted, and I'm here to tell you that we should be wondering about whether that really is the case or not. This is a series of slides that shows the growth in the number of space objects since the beginning of the space age in 1957. And you can see as we go through the decades, the number of objects increases. Of course, these dots are not to scale for the, the size of the space object, but these are all objects larger than about 10 centimeters or so. And as you can see, space has been getting more and more crowded. 
There are currently about 2,000 operational satellites uh, in space. Um, and uh, if you're interested, uh, about 8,800 have been launched since the beginning of the space age. And only um, 2,000 are currently operational. But in addition to the operational space objects, there are some 30,000 objects that are larger than about the size of a coffee cup. And if you begin to count uh, fragments of, of satellites, debris fragments, uh, and so on, then those go into the hundreds of thousands or the millions, depending on the size that you're looking at. And these are all objects that are moving at orbital velocities, namely around 18,000 miles an hour. Also, about two-thirds of the satellites in orbit that are delivering useful services to us here on the ground are in the sort of 700 to 800 kilometer uh, altitude range. So there's certain regions of the space environment that are quite congested. And this, all this material poses a collision risk, not only um, to operational satellites, but of course to other debris objects as well. And so this chart shows you the growth in the population of space objects uh, since the early days of the space age. And what you see here, um, you, the, the, the bars, the red bars along the bottom of the slide show you essentially the number of operational satellites. And then the green, the orange, the blue, and the brown bars show you the other stuff that's up there that is not providing any useful function, but that is a collision hazard to operational satellites. So, Currently, the situation is that about 95% of the objects in space are not performing any useful function, are not controllable, and essentially pose a collision hazard to the other 5% that are providing the services that we all rely on. Now, there are a number of um, uh, issues around this. So I've, I've described the first one is orbital congestion. The next major issue is that space is becoming more global. In the early days of the space age, space activities were dominated by the two superpowers. And um, that situation has changed dramatically. So this was, the, the map I showed previously was in 1966. This is a map, um, I think, 20, uh, 2016. And you see that the number of countries involved in space activities has grown very, very considerably. It also means that space diplomacy has changed. So, in the early days, when the space treaties were being negotiated, this was a photograph taken of the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space in the late 1960s. Um, I happened to have the privilege and the pleasure of uh, working uh, on this committee and, and, in fact, chaired a process developing guidelines for space sustainability. This is what the committee looks like nowadays. We're seeing a much greater number of states, a much greater diversity of um, perspectives and views and technological capacities when it comes to space activities. We're also seeing new kinds of space activities that weren't envisaged during the time when the treaties were negotiated. We're seeing things like on-orbit servicing operations, various kinds of rendezvous and proximity kind of operations. And we don't have rules of the road for how to perform these. Or when people perform them, how do other actors understand or gauge the intent behind such operations? We're also seeing the rise of so-called mega constellations, where uh, certain actors are envisaging not tens or dozens or hundreds of satellites, but thousands of satellites. Recently, there was one uh, filing for about 30,000 satellites in one constellation. And of course, this is greatly um, increasing the congestion in space and has already led to at least one conjunction between one of these new sat, uh, uh, mega constellation satellites and an Earth observation satellite. Also, when you have so many satellites in a constellation, it becomes very difficult to practice collision avoidance maneuvers in the way that have been uh, traditionally practiced up till now. And so people are talking about automating this, having onboard um, collision avoidance maneuvers, uh, or maneuver capability on these satellites. And what this means is that it becomes very, very difficult to predict the orbital path of satellites if you can no longer rely on physics because the satellites themselves are deciding where they want to maneuver. In addition to this, because of the growing reliance of uh, space, um, uh, on space by many states, we're seeing a growing use of space by military actors and, of course, 
Uh, that means that they will protect uh, military assets. And so more and more states are acquiring counter space capabilities and are developing and testing these capabilities, sometimes with kinetic tests in orbit that generate huge amounts of debris that are a hazard to other actors. Now, there are some solutions, of course. Uh, some of these are technical, some are regulatory, and some are political solutions. Among the scientific and technical solutions, there are things like active debris removal that propose to remove objects from orbit. It is very, very difficult to see where the business case lies for this at, uh, at present. However, the technologies that are being developed for things like on-orbit servicing, refueling, and so on, where there could be a business case, would certainly support things like active, active debris removal in future. Then there are another set of uh, possible solutions, and these lie in norms for responsible behavior. There are uh, things like, uh, for example, the 25-year rule, which uh, most or many space actors abide by, but not all, which requires them to deorbit their spacecraft uh, within 25 years after the end of their uh, purposeful life. Not all space missions are able to, to do this because they fail or because they weren't designed to do it, um, or simply because the operators use them, their spacecraft, until they have no more fuel to maneuver. So industry is taking the lead in developing these responsible practices because they realize that the space environment needs to be sustainable if they are to have sustainable businesses. And there are two initiatives in particular. One is called CONFERS, which is generating standards for responsible on-orbit servicing and proximity operations. And these have already been proposed as some standards for ISO. And another initiative called the Space Safety Coalition, which has developed some international guidelines for their industry members. So I just want to end with um, a remark that uh, we have uh, also, at the international level, these industry initiatives and uh, space agency best practices uh, can inform the discussions in multilateral fora, such as the United Nations, to allow us to develop improved guidelines for space sustainability. The UN has already adopted a set of uh, 21 guidelines for space sustainability uh, earlier this year. These are hardly what you would call the cutting edge of what's possible for space safety and space uh, sustainability, but they have raised international awareness of the issue and have sort of um, created a sort of minimum base of what is considered internationally responsible behavior in outer space. So with uh, those remarks, I'll stop there. Very happy to talk to any uh, of you who are interested to find out more about this and um, happy to pick up by email as well. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Neda Bakos, and I am a former CIA analyst. I worked um, in the counterterrorism center at the CIA. I started out actually as an illicit finance analyst. And so majority of the work that I did at the agency was transnational. And doing transnational work means that you're acutely aware of how much geography matters. And, and the impact that it will have on the domain that you're looking at. And ultimately, after today, I'm learning that no matter what the ge geographic domain is, humans will add entropy and screw it up. So geographers should always be in the major conversations that we are having in policy decisions. <laughs> so while looking at, um, at the problem and the issue of, of terrorism, and how it impacts and uses geography. I was looking at data that, first thing that we usually resort to as analysts is talking about, well, where is the problem set? Where is it globally and how does it manifest? And one of the biggest impacts, of course, of terrorism is the amount of people that are impacted and typically in catastrophic ways. So in 2017, the data shows that 10 countries accounted for 84% of all the deaths from terrorism. That doesn't seem like a lot. We hear about terrorism all the time in the news. But at the same time, when you look at the, the levels of catastrophic deaths and understand that terrorism is not defined by a geography or a specific area. It grows in places of conflict, 
but it's not contained in places of conflict. It's a completely transnational issue. Um, terrorism usually grows from some kind of extremist ideology, and that in and of itself is prone to attract players from all over the world, whether it's through foreign fighters that are attracted to conflicts in areas like Syria and traveling back to their home countries, or if it's propaganda that's spread on the internet. For instance, hate organizations. We don't typically think of hate organizations, especially within the United States when it comes to terrorism. But as an ideology and as a bad actor within that scheme, they are essentially a terrorist organization. Many of these organizations are less structured than a lot of the Islamist extremist organizations you hear about, like Al-Qaeda and ISIS. So it's sometimes harder to define the edges. Where are they geographically located? How do they geographically coalesce? They're also a transnational organizations. They use propaganda to, to disseminate their, their message, which, as we know, using the internet, you can reach almost anywhere. So ge geography does play a huge role in social media. For instance, it almost has the, the opposite effect in some of the conflict areas. They don't need to use social media as much to communicate because they're near um, the epicenter of their organizations. But they do use social media to attract other fighters and attract financing and to spread their message and ideology so that they're planting the seed for other people to then join their organizations. And the other thing that I would say about social media is that prevalence does not equal impact. We hear a lot about ISIS because they're very, very good at propaganda. They use videos that were, um, in, in terms of counter -ter or terrorism, were pretty sophisticated when it came to propaganda. There's other organizations, especially hate organizations, where they're not as prevalent, but their impact is just as powerful. And quite often, they're using coded language through memes and through GIFs that isn't as obvious to us if we come across it on Facebook or Instagram or other social media platforms. But it is obvious to them. And what it is is it's planting a seed or called red pilling, where they're attracting a follower to a broader message. That takes them down a rabbit hole of trying to get this person to understand it from their point of view and convert them to their extremist ideology. We know, obviously, that there are, are not easy solutions to terrorism. But what I can say from a, from a geographic perspective, we know that it's transnational. We know some of the underlying causes around terrorism. But it's very difficult, obviously, to harness those in different areas around the world. The solutions vary depending on the country, the organization, in addition to the actor, the bad actor themselves and the victims that they victimize. So another, another way that, um, in my experience, I used geography to do what's called targeting at the CIA was I was actually working on a counterterrorism center in the counterterrorism center on the Iraq group. And my job at the time was to dismantle Al Qaeda in Iraq. And I was working with the US military, in addition to a wide variety of people within the intelligence community. And targeting basically is looking for information from all different areas, whether it's SIGINT, ge geographic collection. Um, it can be through technology or human-based sources. But within the targeting aspect, it was incredibly important for us to be very accurate. And that usually took some type of validation through geographic information. And from a counterterrorism perspective, we majority of that work really cannot be done without that and still be very accurate. I will be happy to answer some questions. OK, well, um, I, I am going to start off with one question uh, for, hopefully, uh, the whole panel to, to con contemplate um, addressing. And again, looking at this as uh, what are these uh, spaces beyond the state uh, by 2050, really, in keeping with that. And uh, I'll just put out the caveat. I appreciate what, what Nada said about 
uh, maybe a greater appreciation after this event for the impact geography has. Anybody that's ever spent any amount of time around me uh, is familiar with uh, kind of the challenge. I, I lay claim to, to saying that geography is the science of everything, and if you can prove me wrong, I will buy you dinner. Um, so in that context, uh, the question I have really, uh, both for uh, kind of the Arctic region, and as I was thinking about this panel and the topics, uh, looking at uh, really East Africa as a nexus, as well as the polar regions uh, because of climate change. But uh, so in East Africa, you've got uh, coastal issues where uh, certain uh, Asian countries may be violating the coastal integrity and exclusion zone or ex exclusive zones of, say, Somalia, which then uh, generate uh, behaviors uh, like uh, kidnapping and hostage taking on uh, ships uh, for ransom, um, which then end up uh, feeding and fueling and funding. Uh, Al Shabaab, which is a terrorist organization, um, so those type of issues, and then you have satellites that that are paying attention to those things, and then in the Arctic, uh, as Lawson pointed out, as as uh, as the ice begins to melt because of climate change, what are the uh, you know the, the issues that we're going to be seeing uh, by 2050? So I guess the question to the panel is, do you feel that that uh, the issues with your with respect to your areas are going to uh, be more likely to trend toward uh, increasing potential for conflict, given uh, the issues in the oceans, uh, in space, uh, with the overcrowding, uh, obviously the Arctic and the, uh, and the Antarctic region, and certainly uh, with regard to transnational uh, criminal en enterprise or terrorist activities, is that, um, where do you see the next uh, 30 years with regard to, to those issues? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, in the Arctic, particularly in the Antarctic, it is a very stable regime, likely to continue that way in the Antarctic, more tightly managed the environment. Uh, in the Arctic, I, I think the specter here, if you read in the media, we're all going to go to war at the top of the world. Uh, but the Arctic states, particularly in Russia, Norway, the, the United States and Canada want to sell stuff to the world. I, I would say that if we're fighting with one another, have a lot of friction at the top of the world, the planet is in big trouble everywhere. No, I, I, I think uh, the Arctic has the potential to remain peaceful, tightly managed by the coastal states, management of the central Arctic Ocean for fisheries, and, and a lower conflict uh, area. E even though our policy here in the United States now for Arctic is uh, this great power rivalry extended between Russia and, Canada, uh, Russia and, and China and the United States to the Arctic, uh, I, I'm not sure that's the right paradigm uh, for, for the top of the world. So I, I think mm. one, uh, I think it's a prob high probability of a peaceful place, top of the world. Others? I'll leap in. On, in the high seas, I think we really have two possible choices of more conflict or more cooperation. That was, we do know that climate change is going to be decreasing the productivity of the high seas. It's going to be making the target fish species smaller. It's going to be weakening the resilience of the ecosystems, the food supply, currents, oxygen levels, you name it. Uh, so the idea that we can continue to fish at current rates is soon going to be obsolete. So we do need the governments of the world to come together to recognize the environmental limits of what is out there. Otherwise, we will be battling over the last fish, uh, which leads to why the global level of um, institutionalized cooperation is really, I think, the way to go. Mm. Peter, Ned? Thank you. Um, so I think from the space perspective, um, what we're seeing is a um, growing number and diversity of space actors, and so that gives rise to a potential for misperceptions, miscalculations, and mistrust. And so we need to come up with various transparency and confidence building measures and other ways to um, increase the transparency and trust of the various uh, actions that uh, space actors carry out in outer space. We need rules of the road that will make it clear what kinds of behaviors are acceptable and which aren't, if we're going to avoid the potential for conflict in space. Also, we need to have cooperative governance to ensure that the increasingly congested space environment becomes a safe and stable operating environment for all space actors. 
Um, looking forward uh, to, the, to sort of the, the next 30 years or so, um, it's likely that space resource utilization will become a reality. Um, and already the space law community is um, looking at the kinds of legal questions that are raised by this. But um, in my view, the contentious issues will be the ones that we face uh, in uh, Earth orbit before the, those uh, more distant um, celestial bodies come into play. Thank you. Um, from a bad actor, non-state perspective, I was just reading a paper from the CIA's website from the 1970s that talked about transnational terrorism and how we, they will continue to see a growth in transnational terrorism and, and bad actors. And I think we can largely say the same thing today. It's a dependent factor on all the other domains like economic viability, uh, climate change because of scarcity of resources. Until we solve some of these other problems, I think you'll continue to see a rise. Hmm. Okay, well, uh, the intent was to have some questions from the audience, but uh, I am being given the nod that we need to conclude. So I'd like to thank our panelists again, and thank you all for uh, remaining with us. Thank you.